My name is John Fredrickson. I'm Vice President of Government for Innocentive. Uh, we're a firm that is uh, crowdsourcing our open innovation marketplace with nearly 300,000 people around the world engaging solving problems for both the public and private sector. Uh, we serve clients all over the world and my responsibility is developing a federal, U.S. federal government and global government practice uh, to try and uh, engage citizens, engage people from anywhere and everywhere to solve every problem possible advancing both uh, government initiatives or private sector initiatives for our clients. Well, I'm glad you didn't fill your plate up too much. Too <laughs> no, many just, just a few things. Little steps, right? Sure. Little steps. Exactly. So, <clears throat> right, we want to increase the participation in our government, government and stuff, but what, as opposed to the work you're already doing, right, why take time out to accept the innovation to come here to talk, talk to everyone here today? Well, I, I think it's interesting because of perspective. This, this being something that globally we see citizens wanting to get involved in government and government talking about being open. Um, I, I think that there's both harmony in that and probably dissonance in that uh, because there's uh, a, a desire for um, most citizens to point out what might be wrong. There's also a desire by citizens to say, I bet I know how to fix that. So in, in the context of using innovation or open innovation and what GovLab is doing, where you can get bright minds together to talk about it, people out of the political realm to come in and, and say this is what we want to do, there's a bit of reality that I'm excited to talk about, which is how do you get your citizenry to trust that if I do help you innovate and help you change and look at government differently, how would I trust that something actually will happen? And that's, I, I think, something that you can't academically study. It is, though, something that you can look at experientially and know and believe that, you know, there are people who don't trust government at all, but could if there were that means for them to engage and engage on something that they have an insight into. So that's why I'm here. It's almost like the, you know, what's in it for me. It is. Yeah, and it's, it's classic know. American culture, right? Exactly. Well, and Maslow's Law. Mm -hmm. the, the lowest yeah. level is really survival. And if government in some, in some fashion here in the United States or around the world has any impact on my survival, it is that fundamental thing that I think people want to engage is, in is how can I survive? And if government can help me survive at a greater level, how could I impact them to improve that? So your company, what, what kind of, what are the specific types of projects or solutions rather that you've been exploring? Sure. So we've worked in the, in the government world uh, on, on a lot of projects. Some of them are classified and I can't really talk about. But some are very public. You can public tell me. I won't, I'll turn off the camera. It's fine. Yeah, yeah I, I trust you. <laughs> so uh, some of the projects are really interesting and open. Na we worked with NASA. NASA has been at the forefront in the federal government in the United States at looking at doing things differently. Rewind the clock to 2007, 2008, when the shuttle programs were uh, starting to wind down. International Space Station is still there. Funding is being reduced. And NASA, even with all the bright minds they've had for decades, had said maybe there's an answer somewhere in the crowd that could help us fundamentally solve problems that we and our bright minds have always worked on. And so they started doing some research at Harvard. They started looking at marketplaces like Innocentive and came to us and said, let's do some pilot challenges. So they came to us with seven challenges. Uh, they solved all seven challenges, meaning they were able to work with us to define what the problem was, have very specific success criteria with an award that would be paid to someone or some people who could come up with a solution technically to these problems. So one of the greatest examples is they had been using a, um, an algorithm to predict solar flare event activity in space. Now it's important when the sun gives off radiation to know when that might happen to protect equipment and life if you're out doing a spacewalk and radiation is coming to you, it's dangerous. And the algorithm that they were using had a four hour window of predictability with 50% accuracy. They came to us, we articulated what was needed, we posted the challenge to our global solver base, 
and got answers from all over the world. The winning answer came from a guy in Lempster, New Hampshire. They would have never found him. We didn't know this guy existed. And this guy, who's a wireless telecommunications engineer retired, had seen it and developed an algorithm to improve what NASA had used for decades to an eight-hour window of predictability, so doubled it, and increased the uh, accuracy to 85%. That's wow. staggering, especially considering that this guy is not a heliophysicist. And so it's that kind of thing that we look at as being something, as a, a particular example, where the crowd and the people you would never know or imagine were there can give that answer because the question was actually framed in a way that excited the people, spoke to what they knew, and this guy could apply even from a completely different industry, a completely different, uh, pardon me, but angle of attack at the problem. He could look at it and say, I have a solution. And we find that being played out across the government all the time. I'd love to get his name if, if uh, before we uh, before we leave, sure. can write that down. Sure, sure. I'd love to follow up with him. Um, <clears throat> so I guess we can go. Well, and we've worked with uh, an another example might yeah. be through Nesta in the UK. We worked with them on how to improve um, the educational system and and um, scores for children in the UK. And we had a solver in Bogota, Colombia, a father and son solver team. Uh, the father, I think, had been an educator. Um, he had suggested uh, more, parental uh, more parental involvement in schools would obviously increase the, the outcomes for students. So, you know, these are the things that governments are interested in. So whether it's uh, healthcare, understanding big data from healthcare, whether it's a um, uh, challenge we did for the State Department in the United States on arms verification, asking citizenry to give some input on that. Those are the kinds of things that are interesting to solvers, especially if there's a, a piece that says government will do something with it. Uh, I'll get personally rewarded for it, either in the form of cash or some form of recognition. Those things are really important to solvers. So it seems like the the main, or at least the strategy that's worked for you guys, is the challenge approach. Is mm -hmm. making an actual deliverable oh, yeah. that you can that you can have change happen, right. and maybe it may not be the biggest thing, but framing in such a way where there's an actual beginning, a process, and then an outcome at the end. That's correct. And part of the framing of the challenge that's important around that is to have what we call boundary objects and what we use in a method we uh, call challenge-driven innovation. Mm -hmm. If you think of the metaphor of a car, so how an automobile is designed has two key elements. There's, there's uh, the engineer who designs the car to operate in a way that's maybe fuel efficient or wind, uh, wind efficient. And there's the designer that looks at the aesthetics. And both of them have to work together. So there's certain boundaries that the designer is limited to in designing what the car looks like because it may change the aerodynamics and it screws up the engineer. And there's certain things that the engineer needs to take into consideration in order to have the design be appealing to who's going to buy the car. So the framing of the question is everything. If you get the correct answer to the wrong question, Instead of going forward, you're probably going sideways or backwards. So that's, that's really the fundamental asset that you have to create is what's the question, what are the boundaries, what are the incentives or rewards, and the boundaries then tell the solver, if I do and work to this point, I have a chance of winning something. And frankly, the government or the private sector industry can use that, I get paid for it. So I guess building that out a little bit, what is a way to really, so you have your challenge, you have your parameters, you have every, all the things you need to have a good solution be produced. Mm -hmm. How do you get citizens to actually be like, oh, there's a solution, sure. there's a problem that I'd like to solve? Sure, that's a great question. So we have an existing market of nearly 300,000 people from around the world. Uh, in over 190 countries around the world. 
that are stimulated by solving challenges. So that's one, one thing. We've already got an established market. We push challenges out to our solvers every week so that they know what's new or what's going to soon expire. Uh, solvers are no different than you and I. We, we may wait till the last minute to submit my solution. It may take me a while to uh, concoct my solution, but we have that outbound push to all, all of our solvers. We also have partnerships with organizations like Nature Publishing, nature.com, uh, Scientific American, AARP, so organizations with broader reach, big communities, and that drives for our clients broader amplification of that message that here's a challenge that you might be willing to, to solve or you might be interested in solving. So that amplification is huge. Um, doing that based around a marketplace that people trust, knowing that we advocate on behalf of the solver if they did actually meet the success criteria of the challenge. So if I hit these five things that I, in a sense, of advocate to my client that someone looks like they met the criteria and, it, and at that point if they did there's an obligation of an award. Mm -hmm. The award could be financial it could be something else, but it's uh, shamelessly taking from MasterCard. It's what's priceless to the solver that incense them to do that. But that's the pricelessness of that reward uh, is not always monetary. It could be solving something no one else had. The public recognition of solving something. We're seeing, I'm an incentive winner on CVs now. So money factors in, but that's not the only thing. Maybe like going to the moon on a spaceship, maybe. It is. I, it, 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 could. Exactly. it could. It could. Exactly. It could. <laughs> uh, we've taken people with NASA, State Department, and Nike actually through a series uh, uh, that they have called launch challenges. Mm -hmm. We ran a challenge of how to improve um, health uh, in, in humans in the first 20 years of life. And the winners in that contest didn't get money, but they went down to... Uh, see a, a shuttle launch down in Florida. They got coaching from VCs and others about their solutions and were able to then present those solutions to NASA, Nike, the VCs and others. So for emerging innovators or emerging companies, they got that visibility that they would never have gotten had they not responded to a challenge. This is great stuff. Um, okay, so final question because I want sure. to get you back to, to your session. Sure. So. Uh, part of GovLab Academy is that we're, one of the things we want to do is instead of people like yourself who just got interested in this field, right? We want to start training it as a field of practice, right? right? So how do we start training students to be kind of these next generation of innovators? Sure. Um, I, I, I think you've got to um, start with challenging every norm that they have. Um, I, I think there's a a view that the only people able to answer very strategic, high-level, maybe policy questions are those who have been educated in in that science and in that in that practice for years and years and years. And the reality is that um, it's probably people who have no background educationally, maybe not even a PhD or a master's degree in political sciences, may not not have studied at all, whether through observation or otherwise. Um, students need to challenge their beliefs in terms of who you believe solvers are. Um, an example, one of the top five chemistry companies in the world, chemical companies, had had a problem that they posted with us. The solution they found was from an 18-year-old undergraduate student in Kazakhstan. Now, there, there's no RFP in the world you could have had to find this person. So now that person opted into your network opted to be in. a solver. Mm -hmm. And then they, they got the, uh, the they, challenge. They, they saw the challenge. They answered it from their experience. Now, imagine this 18-year-old undergrad from Kazakhstan going into this company, knocking on the door and saying, I've got an answer to one of your really big problems. And they would have probably patted him on the head and on the back and said, nice, nice to meet you, Sonny. Come back after you get your PhD. That's cute. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll trust you then. <laughs> and this is a great way of, even in the playing field, for people who either through observation, experience, education, and otherwise could look at things very differently. And that's repeated time and time again. So when students are, are trying to think about innovation in GovLab, innovation in government, you have to start with the premise 
that maybe the most highly educated and those who are most experienced may not have the answer. Mm -hmm. That you've got to start thinking about where are the people on the margins who could look at something radically different and be disruptive in terms of thinking. The other thing is what are the constraints or limits? Because within government, policy and otherwise may be hard stops, hard limits. So the question then becomes is why is it that way? Um, I may not be able to change policy, but what can I do in the context of policy that would have a dramatic effect on some topical area, whether it's the sciences, uh, the environment, um, on policy itself, on things that are really practical day to day. Um, so this is really challenging every belief you have both about innovation, who's best able to answer it, and fundamentally what's the question you need to ask and why. John, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Sure. Thank you. That's great.